So thank you, Alex, for inviting me to come. Thank you all for spending time after hours with me. I know these days, every day is a long day in the market. So uh, I'm delighted to see you all. What I've done is just sent my marketing packet that I use with my clients to Alex. So there's a lot more in here than we're going to go over in our short time together. So forgive me as I will be skipping through all that. But I do want to provide you a little bit of a framework of what I do. Um, I'm the Institutional Equity Strategist for Wells Fargo Securities, tasked with creating an outlook for the S&P 500 and sector and industry allocation recommendations for investors benchmarked to that index. So what I spend the vast majority of my time on is sector and industry allocation especially, because quite frankly, if you're benchmarked to the S&P 500, you hold it. Um, and your uh, value add is generally manipulations or uh, upholdings within that index. So what we work on a lot is sector and industry allocation. I'll give you some broad market commentary as well. I am both a fundamental and a technical analyst, so I practice a bit of a fusion approach, so you will hear me go through fundamentals. I'll try to keep them to a minimum, uh, but I will talk through fundamentals and technicals and, and try to give you a picture of how I see the S&P 500 outlook over the next 12 months, given the both fundamental and technical backdrop. I titled the presentation Navigating Through Policy Change because I do think that uh, with the end of the most recent QE program and potential first rate hike coming within the next 12 months, that policy change is the single largest event that the equity market likely faces over the next 12 months. It's at least the largest forecastable event. Who knows what black swan is lurking around the corner. Uh, in terms of how I look at the market on a fundamental basis, I break the market into its two main fundamental factors, earnings and valuations, and project both earnings and valuations for the index. Right now, I see earnings as a source of support for the index. We're seeing some recovery in leading economic indicators, which should lead to some recovery in earnings growth. Revenues are actually growing for the first time um, at a reasonable pace that in the last three years, really revenues have been quite a, in quite a slump. So we're starting to see some revenue gains driving earnings gains, which provides a fairly solid fundamental source of support for the equity market. Unfortunately, valuations may be a near-term impediment. Our model says that valuations probably sh are about 10% overvalued now. They should trade down to something between 16 and 16 and a half times earnings uh, over the next year. So we have the monetary policy shift on the, well, likely over the next 12 months, and that should create a near-term impediment for multiples, which have been responsible for most of the market gain over the last 18 months. So the market goes from being driven by sentiment and valuations to being driven more by earnings, hopefully, over the 12 months time period. Technicals, in my, in my view, still fairly supportive, but there are a few kinks that are emerging in the armor, and we'll discuss those kinks. Um, over over our, our time today. The intermediate price trend is still very strong. I call it don't fight the channel because the index has been in this channel uptrend for the vast majority of the last year, year and a half. But the new highs and large caps that we just experienced were unconfirmed. And we're probably in the process of removing that divergence as we speak uh, with the weakness of the index evident over the last week. But nonetheless, they were not confirmed. There are some fairly mixed intermarket cues as well. In particular, I'm watching small caps and high yield, which also have struggled somewhat over the last six months, not confirming the new highs in the large cap index. Our recommendations at the sector level, built upon a foundation of fundamentals and technicals equally, are technology, healthcare, and materials as overweight sectors, underweights are staple utilities, telecom, discretionary. So we'll go through relative price charts of all 10 sectors. I do want to make sure to get through that. A few charts on earnings growth. You can see earnings growth in this cycle really low for a mid-cycle, falling to near 0%, including financials actually dipped below zero uh, in the 2012 period, but starting to show some recovery on the backbone of recovering revenue growth. See the negative revenue growth experienced outside of the financial sector in late 2012 2013. So, we were in an environment a year, year and a half ago where revenues were fairly slim, earnings were fairly slim, the market was purely being driven by multiples. I think that's going to reverse over the next year. The market may take a pause, allowing earnings growth to catch up with that multiple expansion, but nonetheless, we are starting to see some earnings growth. 
This is a model um, of leading economic indicators. The 10, the composite indicator that the conference board puts out includes 10 leading economic indicators of growth. It's the single best leading indicator of S&P 500 operating earnings growth over time. It has nearly tripled its pace of growth over the last year, suggesting that earnings are going to recover into a much stronger territory over the year and into next year. Our expectations are very similar to bottom-up consensus for 2014 and 2015. 2016, between you and I, is a pretty much a crapshoot at this point. You just take former modeled estimates and project them forward onto 2016. There's just not a lot of visibility into 2016 this early. Um, so I wouldn't read too much into it. Nonetheless, 2015 to 2014, we look pretty close to consensus. So I have a pretty strong um, sort of fundamental Optim fundamentally optimistic view of earnings. What I'm a little worried about is the multiple. I model the PE multiple on the S&P 500 using short-term interest rates, inflation, demographics in the form of uh, labor force growth, and the deficit as a share of GDP to try to get a feel for private sector economic growth dynamics. And my model right now says that the multiple is about 10% of a fair value um, estimated by fundamentals. So, you know, does it necessarily mean that the PE has to revert exactly back to my estimate? No, but it does suggest that we're getting a little bit overvalued um, just based on pure fundamentals. This is a long-term chart of PE. I'm not going to waste your time with that. Regarding expected returns, there is a fairly significant stair-step um, chart that we like to show. Given the level of the multiple now at 17 times earnings, we should expect something like a 5% annualized return over the one-year time horizon, near 10% annualized return over the three-year time horizon, uh, much better 20% or so annualized return over a five-year uh, time horizon in this bucket of 15 to 20 times earnings. For perspective and history at 17 times earnings, the index is trading. Um, within the upper one-third of history. So two-thirds of history, the index is traded at below 17 times earnings. One-third of history is traded at 17 or above. So we're right in that one-third of history. Not tremendously overvalued, but on the edge uh, of overvalued. This chart shows you what happened the last two times the Federal Reserve started increasing interest rates. Their first interest rate hikes of the cycle were in 1994 and 2004. The P.E. multiple on stocks in 2004 fell 8%, it fell 21% in 1994. This shows you uh, what happened when they ended QE1 and ended QE2. The very small bits of time that we've experienced life without QE are the white bars in that graph. And you can see the experience for valuation multiples fell pretty tremendously in each of those periods. So I would say the risk is that multiples fall potentially even more than I'm forecasting over the year. I don't know how much they'll fall, and like I said, my fundamental model says that they should hold up reasonably well because we have short rates only rising a touch, but sentiment can overwhelm, um, certainly. I doubt there was much by fundamental reason. Certainly interest rates didn't change dramatically when the Fed ended QE1 and QE2. Certainly inflation didn't change dramatically. Certainly growth didn't change dramatically in either of those periods. Nonetheless, multiples crashed. So the risk is, I would say, to the downside for the PE multiple over the next 12 months. In the intermediate, now we can get to the technical graphs that I've prepared. By the way, if you want to interrupt me to ask questions, I urge you to do so. This is my eighth meeting of the day. I've gone through this presentation a lot. <laughs> so I could be getting a little stale. I apologize. Um, but I, you know, I'd love to take questions as we go. Otherwise, I'll just stare at you at the end until you ask a question. Yeah. I have questions about earnings, actually. Um, yes. The um, charge of um, earnings. I mean, the last time I looked at the, um, uh, this is quite Which one? This one here? Back. Um, no, uh, further back. This one. Uh, no, Keep going. Um, the very first chart. Yeah, it might be. Good memory. Back to chart one. The one before this, actually. Oh, that's just where it's. Oh, okay. hang <laughs> Maybe it's the one after. Um, Revenue growth? Well, ask your question. Maybe yeah, you anyway, maybe this, uh, these aren't the charts I've looked at myself. Anyway, but um, the last time I looked at um, the earnings, um, chart, um, it showed that um, earnings was actually at a historical high. In the, in the oh, levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, 
I, I take your point, but actually, how do you beat that? I mean, earnings yeah. are at historical yeah. high levels. I mean, where can they go unless there's really, really robust growth? Okay. It just doesn't seem like there is going to be. Um, so the level of operating earnings per share is at a new high, beyond peak in 2007. Operating earnings by themselves are actually not yet back to 2007 peak levels. Also, think about the nature of growth. Earnings over time have not reverted to a mean, but have reverted to a trend. And that trend is based on longer term economic growth. Populations grow, economies grow, corporate earnings grow as a result. The only time that earnings really usually fall is if a broader, broader economy goes into recession. And then earnings revert back below trend. But most of the time, earnings make new peaks with every single cycle throughout time. So it's actually anomalous that we would have at this point in time, new highs on GDP, new highs on operating earnings per share, but not yet new highs on operating earnings. So there's plenty of room to the upside as long as economic growth continues to fuel those greater and greater earnings levels going forward. Um, one thing I do talk about is there's a little bit of accounting trickery that goes on in this world. And operating earnings per share being well above former peak levels, but earnings not above former peak levels is a little problematic because it tells you that you're paying for corporate actions. You're paying for share buyback. The supply and demand of shares is actually having an impact on stocks, and supply and demand of shares is not something I forecast. So it's this anomalous factor that's actually that's supporting stocks as well. Do you think, though, that, that, that that's quite a kind of key point because um, a lot of what I read is that, um, the, the, that QE has been used by, by banks and companies basically to fuel um, the, uh, the, the high yield trend. Uh -huh. And they use that money that they've, that they've basically found in the markets to buy back all the shares and that propels <coughs> the, the market higher. And of course, if the market crashes when QE ends, yeah. then, then uh, there will be a recession. And when it that, is. I think that I would struggle to make the, make the statement that QE is directly going to banks who are buying shares true because the banks are very, very heavily regulated at this point and just received over the last year no, permissions so. um, from the Fed to buy back. And the mechanism by which QE gets into the hands of corporates outside of the financial sector is also very, very tenuous. So the QE basically is the Fed buying treasury bonds from whoever owns them in its nutshell, right? Who, who owns the vast majority of treasury bonds? Global central banks, um, individual private investors uh, are the other two major owners. Corporates don't actually own treasury bonds for the most part outside of sure. financials. <coughs> so you have to have somehow the financial system funneling money to corporates, which they do through lending to some degree. But that channel's been fairly broken. The corporates have come directly to market to attain their capital. They are buying back shares. So the question then is, you know, are they buying back shares purely because of QE or because of something else? And the historical evidence suggests that corporates actually do buy back shares as long as profit growth and, capital and cash flows support share buybacks. So there's a very intense positive correlation between corporate cash flow and share buybacks. This cycle, while it seems anomalous on share buyback, is not tremendously anomalous. 25% of the operating earnings recovery in the last cycle from 2002 to 2007 was also purely because of the share count reduction on the index or corporate buybacks <coughs> for the most part. So I don't think it's because of QE. I do think you have a risk that buybacks are damaged from QE if QE first is proven to damage economic prospects, which will damage earnings prospects, and earnings damaged earnings prospects will damage buyback trend. But I don't think that I could make the connection directly from QE to buyback. I think that's a harder connection. I, I wasn't making it. I was just yeah. saying that QE was fueling. Um, yeah, it, it certainly is fueling well, some degree of risk taking. Yeah, 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 some degree of risk taking, some sentiment toward risky assets. I think I would absolutely make that argument and have made that argument. And that's the risk, is the removal of that QE, does that reverse the sentiment? Um, and with the end of QE1 and QE2, we certainly saw some evidence of that. On top of that, though, with the end of QE1 and QE2, we also had European shocks. 
So will we have uh, fears of a financial crisis emerge somewhere in addition to the end of QE? Are they coincident or are they actually interrelated? We don't know for sure, um, but it is a risk. Could, could what the ECB is providing replace? Um, it's a very good question because the ECB is, actually, ECB is not actually officially providing anything yet, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> uh, what I will say is this program, this QE3 program that the Fed embarked upon at the beginning of 2013 was immense, $80 billion a month. It's slowed to a $15 billion pace, or will slow to a $15 billion pace as of this month, um, or as of next month, but you know, can the ECB replace all of it when the Fed slows it to zero as of November? I don't know. And I don't know because I don't know how much or what or how the ECB is going to buy. The stated goal of buying exists, and I think that that would sort of draw liquidity provision by the ECB and probably by the Japanese Central Bank as well. Could support liquidity conditions. The Fed's certainly not taking anything away yet. Which so maybe all of this argues for risk assets to remain at some degree of elevated level. Um, I don't know. Okay, S and P. Don't fight the channel. Pretty clear, continuous uptrend in price. I have some issues with the recent move beyond peak levels because it was not supported by momentum or breadth. Uh, let me see if we blow these up. No. We didn't even blow these up, so I apologize. They're a little small. The chart on the right is RSI. The chart on the or the left is RSI. The chart on the right is the advanced decline line. So, the chart on the right shows RSI making a lower peak with the new high in price. A pretty clear divergence on momentum. We saw the same with the MACD, um, and then advanced declines. You can barely see these, but making lower and lower peaks with the increase in price that occurred with it lower and lower peaks in each of these scenarios as well. So some divergence, you know, these divergences can be small and very, very short term in nature. I do have my suspicion that these are being closed as of the last week. Um, but nonetheless, they did diverge. We called it out two weeks ago, and now we're seeing some market weakness in the very short term. Longer term, I have some other concerns. And most of these are factors to watch. They're not factors to jump to the conclusion that we should sell all of our equity positions, but they're factors to watch. This first one is margin debt, which has become a little bit controversial recently, so I thought I'd throw it in there. Margin debt did not rise with the stock price rates all summer. As a matter of fact, margin debt peaked back in the spring when small cap stocks peaked. Um, very similarly, in the 2000 peak and the 2007 peak, margin debt peaked roughly six months before the ultimate peak in the index. So what do, I, what do I view this as? This simply to me is some hesitancy on the part of risk takers. When, when prices are rising and the trend is very, very strong, margin debt generally rises with it. We saw some disruptions in here with the end of the beginning of QE programs. This is back in 2010-2011. Uh, but we've had this pretty consistent rise higher in margin debt ever since that period. So the fact that margin debt didn't reaccelerate with the new peak in stocks this summer uh, could be a warning signal for the index. This is a chart that I show a lot. I'm actually thinking of dropping because I think too many people follow it now, so it's sort of its usefulness is depleted, unfortunately. But nonetheless, the Investors Intelligence Survey does show a relatively elevated level of bullish advisors. We smooth this number because it is incredibly volatile. But usually it does surge to above 60% when you're nearing a market peak. The percentage of bears, which is not on this chart, is now below 15%, which is usually also affiliated with the near market peak. So we do have some degree of optimism and complacency on the part of the investment community. I think you would struggle to say that the retail investor is optimistic or complacent still, so there is that sort of missing leg of enthusiasm, but that wasn't there in 2007 either. Yeah. Do you think they're in, the retail investors? Do I think they're in? Mm. Um, yes. I think they wrote, the, those that are still in, are in, were also in at the peaks and troughs over the last 10 years. So it's all relative. If you look at the households, if you look at the, the most aggregate measure of what is owned, and you look at household 
stock and mutual fund ownership as a share of financial assets on their balance sheets. They have as much exposure to the equity market as they had at the 2007 peak, but not as much as they had at the 2000 peak. I think they've been generally out since the crash in 2000. You've had a little bit of entry back into the market in the last cycle. You've had a little bit here now, but it's not enough to move the needle on outright ownership. Instead, ownership is just trending with the price direction. So I think there's a, plenty of investors that could reallocate capital to the equity market. I don't know how much that is. I think that some of these statements about all the cash on the sidelines are completely overblown because they're just taking the aggregate level of cash as if all that cash could magically go into the equity market. Most households need their cash for others to service other purposes. Right? So they're not going to invest all of that cash in the equity market. But I do think that there is evidence that you could see ownership go higher. I and mean, it went higher in the year 2000. Um, so I have sort of mixed feelings on it. When you look at investor, individual investor surveys of bullishness, only about 35% of individual investors suggest that they're bullish right now. You need to usually get to 50% in order to see some kind of major peak. Um, but we didn't get there in 2007 either, so it's not a perfect indicator. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. Let's move to small caps. It's probably not very well seen on this chart, but these circles are peaks in the market. Again, small caps um, have led peaks in the large cap index in each of the major peaks of the last 15 or so years. And the year 2000, small caps peaked in the spring, along with the, the initial peak in the S&P 500. The S&P made a push uh, into August of that year, basically closing at a slightly lower low than the spring, um, ultimately resulting in the crash through 2002. In 2007, small caps peaked roughly six months before the large cap peak in October 2007. Again, small caps made a near-term peak in March tried to press beyond that peak with the July surge in stocks and failed to do so. So you do have this mini divergence that's developed with small caps and large caps. Now these things can happen for short periods of time, so I don't want to read too much into this. It's only a six month period so far, but it does present some risk to the recent uptrend in large caps. Does it mean this is a 2000 or 2007 peak? Not necessarily. And as a matter of fact, small caps can lag large caps for long periods of time, but it's very rare for small caps to be falling and large caps to be rising for longer than six months or so. So we're at a point where we're going to probably test this theory out over the fall. Personally, I think that large caps have probably run a little too far too fast, maybe in due for a pause or some sort of near-term correction. And then, provided that our economic and earnings growth forecast comes to fruition, it proves to be a pause that refreshes. Uh, but we'll see. We see something very similar potentially developing with high yield, though high yield is held in better than small caps. Something we're looking for is the same sort of divergence to develop. And high yield, high yield peaked roughly six months before the large cap peaks in each of these cycles. High yield has shown some peak-like activities that seems to be trading kind of around peak levels. Um, so we'll see what happens with high yield as well, but it's something to watch. I've been watching the 10-year, I think, um, one of the more fascinating studies that someone a lot smarter than me could do over time is the consensus miss on the 10-year over 20 years of time, because we're getting really close to the consensus missing the forecast for the 10-year Treasury yield for nearly two decades now. I was actually an economist before I took on this role, and one of the things we struggled with was why is the 10-year Treasury yield not following our modeled expectations for, it's now a full 15 years, but we may be going on 20 before long. The consensus has suggested that fundamentals mandate that the 10 year treasury yield should be higher. And it's not going higher. <laughs> this is the 10 year treasury pattern this year. We have recently broken this downtrend. Um, we went back to test this 260 level. We traded in this 260 to 280 level for the good of at least most of the first quarter into the second quarter this year. We broke that support line at 260. We're now back to testing it again. My suspicion is if we can get under, into this range again, we'll probably trade in the range for a while. Um, but I don't know if the consensus forecast for rates to move higher is going to go 
it is going to actually come to fruition. I use the trend in the yield curve as one of my key inputs, and the yield curve has been flattening all year. It makes a big difference for sector strategy. The absolute level of the 10-year Treasury yield is nearly meaningless for anything outside of the financial sector within the S&P 500. So, you know, folks really point to it as a huge indicator, as something very, very meaningful. You know, I think it has its uses, it's just not a huge indicator. Instead, I think we should study why we're getting the forecast around this particular fund. Something else that I've been watching that does have implications for sector strategy is this potential bottom that is formed in the Chinese exchange. This is the Shanghai Composite, which for those of you that follow this at all know has been an incre incredible bear market for years. Really trading around, bouncing around this bottom. Um, what I see here is a potential reverse head and shoulders with a really complex shoulder um, to potentially fi finalize this pattern. Uh, you also could make this into a big rounding saucer bottom. Um, either way, the Shanghai has shown some incredible signs of life. Coincident to, or because of, pretty tremendous shift in monetary policy that's gone on within China over the last year. In the six months leading up to this spring, we saw the single largest depreciation of the Chinese currency since the currency started floating back in the middle of the last decade. Uh, that seems to have resulted in some signs of life in the composite, some growth in sentiment, some improvement in some of the economic data. We also saw the central bank reduce the reserve requirements in China for the first time in several years. We started to see some bottoming in the, price, the copper price. So we're teed up for a pretty big shift, or we're on the verge of, I think, a pretty decent sized shift um, coming out of China for the first time in a long time. This has implications for the materials sector, the industrial sector, and the energy sector within the S&P 500, all of which we started to nip at and edge into over the last uh, nine months or so. Incidentally, I have been underweight energy and materials from the middle of 2011 until the spring of this year. So we have been avoiding these sectors like the plague, and a lot of that is because of the Chinese chart. Couple, two more charts on global um, equity markets to watch. You can have periods of time, absolutely. There's no strong correlation over the very, very long term necessarily between the S&P 500 and the stocks 600 here in Europe. However, I do find it interesting that as the ECB decreased interest rates to negative territory and announced QE, we've seen nothing but um, a negative price trend emerge out of the stocks 600. That says to me that, who asked me the question about liquidity in the ECB? That says to me that the market at least is telling you this may not work, this may not be enough. The market is erring on the side of skeptical right now. You know, every move that the Fed has made has resulted in a recovery in price trend for the S&P 500. So the fact that the ECB makes these announcements and it doesn't result in such a thing for the stock 600 even for the German stocks by themselves, the French stocks by themselves, Italian stocks by themselves, says something about the market sentiment toward these moves. Japan is a very interesting situation as well. Last year, 2013, when both Japan and the US were firing on all cylinders with QE, we had nearly 100% correlation between daily price changes on the UK and the S&P. That correlation completely broke down as of the beginning of this year. Uh, the Nikkei has failed to exceed its price peak back in December of last year, while the S&P 500 continues to march higher. We should have a policy announcement from the Japanese Central Bank sometime this fall. It remains to be seen whether that will be enough to reverse this uh, divergence. And then finally, this is the giant triangle chart that I'm watching to change the world of sector strategy for the S&P 500 and that is commodity prices. We've been coiling in this symmetrical triangle on commodity prices for years. And a breakout, when we eventually do see one, maybe within the next 12 to 18 months, can create major disruption. Um, either we've got deflation or inflation head, nobody knows the answer. So far we've been in this wonderful environment of nothing. CPI is printing 2%, no real change in inflation. 
Um, but I think we're on the verge of seeing the major change there. I thought we might get there with a break above here, but naturally we didn't. So <laughs> we're still working through it. Okay, I know you can't read this. That's not intentional. Well, maybe it is intentional, but um, you can pick up the package another time. This basically is my giant sector and industry strategy for the S&P 500. Uh, sectors on the left side, overweights, tech, healthcare, and materials. Industries um, across the top. Overweight within tech, internet software and services, and computers. Underweights within tech or IT services and electronic equipment. We cover most of the industries within the S&P 500. Not all of them, um, but most of them. And I, like I said, um, I'm happy to make this available to you. I think it's going to be posted on the website. So absolutely, if you pull this up and have questions, I'm happy to take them. These are my estimates. What I use for sector strategy, combination of fundamentals and technicals. I run 10 different sector models built on fundamental econometrics. Um, I use these to compare with consensus estimates to get an earnings achievability score. That's one of the factors that I use in my sector selection model. A second factor is revision momentum. This is the momentum change in analyst estimates of revisions minus down revisions over total revisions. Um, I use that at the sector level also, so that's factor number two. Uh, this is another picture of revisions. Factor number three is tougher to, to describe in a chart. It's valuations for all 10 sectors. But I just do simple PEs for all 10 sectors. Compare those to historical uh, relative to the index. Um, I'll show you this chart. I don't know how relevant it is. It's one of the reasons why I think the Fed is going to start increasing interest rates. Every time the Fed has started increasing interest rates over the last five years, the discretionary sector has made a peak and started a negative relative price trend within six months prior to that first rate hike. Every time in 40 years. This is your single best indicator of the Fed within the S&P 500. It's discretionary relative to the index. Everyone wants to watch financials and energy what matters is discretionary. So the fact that the discretionary sector started to break down late winter, early spring, could be telling you that the Fed on the rate hike, or the market is at least positioned for a Fed rate hike. <coughs> We're starting to position it accordingly. This chart's a little tough to read on screen, I apologize, but the left side shows S&P performance while the yield curve is flattening during all flattening periods and bear flattening periods since 1975. This side shows S&P sector performance while the yield curve is inverted and then the yield curve is steepening. Um, essentially, a flattening yield curve is not necessarily awful for stocks on the whole. You can see average returns are actually pretty good during flattening periods. It is pretty bad for certain sectors, usually defensives underperform, cyclicals outperform, and mid to later stage cyclicals are your best performers. That's the period, that, that's the, 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 our base case scenario. A yield curve inversion, contrary to popular belief, is also not terrible for the S&P 500. Um, usually, actually, stocks don't peak until after, almost a year after the yield curve starts inverting. <clears throat> but energy and some of the defenses tend to do best. And then in a yield curve steepening, your consumer sectors tend to be your best performing sectors. So stage of cycle and yield curve do play into our sector strategy. Uh, mostly through the earnings component. This is the tech relative price chart. So this is what I do all day long. I pull these relative price charts and I uh, pontificate on them. But this is the tech relative price chart. Um, I think we made a major bottom in relative price back here. In uh, mid-2013, we had a positive crossover of the 50-day moving average over the 200-day moving average. We finally crossed over this negative trend line that developed through this lower peak. Um, and it's been just off to the races ever since. So we went overweight tech very, very early, the very beginning of 2014, so right about here. And it's been a pretty decent call for us, sticking with our overweight on tech. Here's revision momentum for tech, uh, and what revision momentum looks like on a relative basis, relative to the index, tech estimates have been printing higher. This is healthcare in a very, very strong channel. It's existed for Going on two and a half years, no reason to fight this trend. Here's te uh, healthcare relative revision momentum, kind of moderate, but nonetheless, you've got a higher high here. Uh, kind of 
pinkish potential here, but nothing too worrisome. Oops, here's materials. I think the commodity complex made a major bottom um, back here in the 2013 period and started starting to look a little better. This is where Amy right now. This could be a negative crossover in the 50-day or the 200-day. Still yet to be confirmed, so I am watching it very, very carefully. I have a feeling though I'm probably going to hold on to this until we, if we pop, if we um, cross through some of these bottoming, some of this bottoming process, I'll start to get a little bit more worried about a reversal in this more positive price trend that's developed. We've got a turnaround that's occurred in materials revision momentum, still negative but less and less negative, also to confirm the price trend. Here's energy's relative price chart. Looks almost exactly like materials. I mentioned that I've been underweight energy and materials from the middle of 2011. So that's back here when we started to see this negative cross. Probably was my trigger. I don't really remember, but something in this area started to trigger me to get bearish. We held on to the underweight all the way until the spring. I wasn't going to fight against this gigantic underperformance line until I got some confirmation. We just started dipping into the energy sector. I think that this, we got overbought, now we're probably oversold. It's probably noise within what is more of a market performance emerging for the sector. Um, generally confirmed by better revision momentum, certainly less bad momentum, and even dip in a positive territory. Not as strong as it was back in 2010. So we've moved to market weight on energy. Industrials has been a fascinating sector. I wouldn't be surprised to see this as the relative price bottom forming for industrials because it's right on this long-term uptrend line that started all the way back in the recession, spike lower in relative performance. Um, but nonetheless, it's just been a waterfall decline all year. <clears throat> We've held on to our market weight on this one, fighting the price trend because of this. This is relative earnings revision momentum, which just continues to improve. Valuations don't look too expensive, and my earnings model says that these are reasonably achievable, and revision momentum keeps moving more positive. So we fought against um, a pretty negative price trend all year holding a market weight. Then on the underweights, on financials, um, it looks to me like financials relative performance peaked back in the middle of 2013 when interest rates troughed. Uh, we've seen the index sort of the financial sector relative performance line cross negatively here, cross through this long-term upward price trend performance line back in um, the spring of 2014. 50-day is still trading below the 200-day, but we've been testing this support level, which now appears to have become something of a resistance level for quite some time. Um, in general, I think the structural view on financials is still fairly negative. The earnings revision momentum supports our fundamental case, which is quite negative. My estimate for financials earnings next year is half that of consensus. Discretionary, this is also an underweight for us. We had a death cross back here, first one of the cycle, which is pretty fascinating. This was one of the strongest, longest uptrends in discretionary's high price history. Um, but you did have a death cross. You had a uh, cross underneath the long-term support line. This is a support line that goes way back into 2009, incidentally, which is why it doesn't touch anything on this graph. Uh, we've kind of seen a little bit of a bounce back after probably an oversold level, but I don't see anything that's really worth dipping my toe in the water on discretionary, <clears throat> particularly considering the negative revision momentum. Maybe it's getting less bad, but it's really exciting. Also, these two sectors, discretionary and staples, are the two sectors most negatively correlated to the Fed funds rate over time. This is the staples relative price chart, and it's been underperforming sort of on trend since early 2013. We've had these modest bounce backs, but the 50-day moving average has held below the 200-day moving average for an incredibly long period of time. Um, currently testing the support level, so maybe something to watch, nonetheless. It doesn't look particularly appealing. Revision momentum, maybe bottoming. Tough to say. Not really worth dipping your toe in considering the fact that the Fed's likely to increase rates in the sense this sector is very sensitive. Third quarter earnings season could be brutal for this sector because of the bottom of uh, the last month or two. Telecom, you know, nothing terribly exciting here. It's a 
fairly persistent negative price trend that emerged back in the middle of 2012. We've attempted to go back and test our 200 day moving average, failed every time. Um, you do have sort of this higher low that's emerged along with lower highs, so something of a triangle pattern, maybe, but then we dipped below it. So, you know, I don't, I don't see a lot in, in the telecom graph despite the fact that I'm constantly looking for it. Um, you know, after a decline like this, it's just, okay, at some point we're going to see some major reversals, you would think, but. Not, not enough to really get excited yet. And then utilities. This is a sector I talk a lot about this year because utilities had such a great first quarter. Um, and I get a lot of clients that want to hang on to that performance because they see the year-to-date numbers still look pretty good. However, utilities just recorded another death cross in relative performance. So the 50-day crossing under the 200-day moving average. The peak performance was actually back in the spring period and we've made a series of lower, a couple lower highs since then. So, you know, I think that given this long-term structural downtrend, that it is very evident in the utilities chart. Um, these bounce backs have always been uh, something of dead cat bounces, so to speak. So, you know, I'm still avoiding the utility sector. This one I'm avoiding because this long-term structural downtrend is enough to overwhelm what is an improving earnings price trend earnings revision trend in the utility sector in my mind. And then that's it. So here's a lovely logo. If you'd like to read the disclosures, you can sift your way through those as well um, on the website. And I'm happy to take any other questions that you might have. Any different reads of the charts you want to talk about? Yeah. Uh, it's more about your approach. Um, if you get a discrepancy, a major discrepancy, and how you see uh, markets and your fundamental outlook. Yep. How do you resolve that? I don't usually. I do sometimes. Um, and I made the mistake last year of leaning on fundamentals over technicals. <laughs> um, so I probably will lean on technicals over fundamentals for a while just because of recency bias. Uh, I, I rarely get it in the sectors. The only place I'm getting it in sectors right now is on utilities because the price trend is so negative and earnings revision momentum is improving. But every one of those other charts was generally supporting the price trend on a relative basis. You said the 10-year yield you mentioned earlier as well. Yeah, the 10-year yield, well, to some degree. The 10-year yield doesn't necessarily correlate terribly closely with the S&P 500. Over a long period of time, it's got an R squared of something like 30. So. You know, and I think what happens with the 10 year is you go through these regime shifts, and certain regimes declining 10 years bad for stocks, certain regimes rising 10 years good for stocks. We could be on the verge of a regime shift if we get a breakout in inflation prospects where rising 10 years is actually bad for stocks. We haven't been there for 15 years, but we might be on the verge of that. So let's see. But so I don't use the 10-year as much. I don't think the 10-year is actually conflicting necessarily with what's happening in the S&P 500. I think you could easily make the argument that they're both reflecting ample liquidity conditions. Um, but, you know, it flies in the face of last year. The liquidity conditions were ample as well in the 10-year rows. So I think that's why I said somebody smarter than me has got to do a study on what really drives the 10-year treasury bond because nobody's figured it out. Do you think it bottomed in 2012 when you had set for What's that, the 10 year treasury? Yeah, exactly, do you think that this is that's it for the, the um, I think it's highly likely. Yeah. But I say highly likely because I'm really not certain. I think it's completely and totally possible that we have a recession sometime in the next three years that takes the 10 year treasury lower. And this sort of flight to quality overwhelms. I mean, you've got. Some pretty strange things emerging in global debt markets with French bond yields going into negative territory. You know, Spanish and Italian debt roughly equivalent in yield to U.S. debt. So why wouldn't you constantly buy U.S. debt and keep and that would keep pressing yields lower? So, you know, I don't I don't know what to make of it all right now. I don't want to suggest that the most likely outcome is for rates to go tremendously higher. I think instead maybe we're range bound here for a little while. 
Um, certainly, that's the low for now. I notice you, you haven't um, got you haven't looked at the dollar at all. Um, yeah. This performance, which is going to be, I guess, pretty crucial if there's a dollar breakout. Uh, you know, you'd be surprised as to how not crucial it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, the, which is the reason why I don't look at it. So we had a forecast for the dollar to rise about three percent this year at the start of this year. The the effect of a three percent rise on on S and P 500 earnings per share is less than five cents on an index that's earning more than a hundred dollars per share over a year. Only 30% of S&P 500 revenues now come from overseas. That's down from 40% of the peak of the cycle. We're less sensitive to the dollar than we were even just six years ago. Um, and that's natural transition in the index. There is a very low correlation between the dollar and the S&P over time. It has very strong implications for certain sectors. That's why I mentioned it for the staples sector. It has very strong implications for specific earnings seasons because if companies' hedging programs don't get it right, you can have an earnings disruption due to currency. And we probably will have that in third quarter for the staple sector, is my best guess. Because the dollar also is so intensely correlated with oil prices, WTI anyway, you've seen WTI in a mirror image of the dollar strength. And the result has been compression in S&P 500 earnings estimates, which will probably create a disruption for third quarter as well. Beyond that, it's not as meaningful. But doesn't it concern you, I mean, that, that if there were a, a, a new dollar ball, like, like there was in the 90s, yeah. which was correlated with a lot of foreign money going into the United States and going into stocks and um, uh, bonds, I mean, that would obviously have major implications for that kind of regime change? Um, look, <laughs> we surged to the same peak in 2007 when the dollar declined from 2002 to 2007. So I think it's coincidental that the dollar rose and stocks rose in the 1990s. I don't think it was because of the dollar that stocks rose. Um, and, and I say that simply because we had the mirror image experience from 2002 to 2007, the dollar plummeted and stocks rose. So I don't know that it is that meaningful. And then you go through, it's very similar to the 10-year treasury bond. You go through regimes where the dollar and stocks are positively correlated, and you go through regimes where the dollar and stocks are negatively correlated. Right now, we have only 30% of sales coming from overseas. Uh, so 70% of sales are domestic, so dollar strength can be a positive for the index. It will be a negative in the third quarter because of the plummet in oil prices, and energy is still big enough that it'll make a difference in the third quarter. But if we get to a point like we did in the 90s, where energy is 5 10% of the index instead of 20, it'll, the dollar strength will mean something positive, right? But I think it completely depends upon market cap concentrations within the index, and it can, depends upon that because it really is only meaningful for certain segments of the S&P. So how far along the cycle then do you think we are in terms of, you mentioned recovery, mm -hmm. earnings, uh, are we sort of near the tail end of that? Or? I think we're mid. I think we're toward the middle. I actually think that the cycle didn't start until 2011. The economic cycle is what I'm referencing specifically. Because 2011 is when we finally saw our bottom and lift off in the housing market. And the housing market has, over the last four cycles anyway, been the key indicator for economic cycles. I think we saw our peak in early cycle performance back in 2013, last summer, when home prices reached their peak acceleration, pace of acceleration, activity reached its peak pace, started to slow over the last year. That's usually your key indication that you're moving to another stage of the cycle, or the cycle's over. I don't think the cycle's over because the data has started to recover in favor of other industries contributing to growth. Capital spending starting to show some modest signs of life. We're starting to get in, you know, production indices looking a little bit better outside of the energy complex. So I, we're starting to see more late cycle sorts of industries improve. So we're moving, I think, from early stage to mid, mid probably over the next year we'll move into later stage. You know, it's Quite frankly, it's a crapshoot at, at this time because the Fed isn't here to guide us. You normally have, we should have had a Fed funds increase last summer by typical economic cycle dynamics, but we have a Fed 
that is fighting the Great Depression when there is no Great Depression. So, what does it mean? I don't know. Um, the Fed's not there for your usual, because the Fed's usually a key factor in that cycle shift, and they're missing. Instead, it seems to have been that bottom in the long-term treasury bond that created something of a cycle shift. We'll see if it remains intact. Okay? Well, thank you all for having me. Thank you for staying awake and sitting through the last hour. Um, I'll be around for a little while if you want to chat a little bit more. Um, Dan, thank you very much for all the time.